Welcome. Um, I'm David Skirman, a senior policy analyst here at New America. And today we're here to launch a new report, the latest in New America and ASU series on proxy warfare in the greater Middle East. The report is titled Social Networks, Class, and the Syrian Proxy War. To discuss it, we have Anand, um, Anand Gopal, um, author of the report, fellow with New America and research professor with ASU, as well as Jeremy Hodge, who is the co-author of the report, and Elizabeth um, Serkov, who is a non-residential fellow with the New Lines Institute, who will provide remarks on the paper and then they will all have a discussion about the paper's findings and the current um, status of the conflict and what the paper tells us about it. So to begin with, I'll turn it over to Anand, who um, will begin with the description of the paper's findings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I have to apologize to start with because uh, this paper is uh, something like 70 pages long and maybe 25,000 words. Uh, so that could seem daunting, but if you think of it as like a really, really, really short book, then you can read it very quickly. Um, and that's the spirit you should think you should take it in. Uh, th so the genesis of this paper actually um, probably goes back at this point 10 years or nine years. I was in Syria in 2012. This is the spring of 2012 at the height of the conflict when uh, the Assad regime was going around, especially in Northern Syria and laying waste to towns and villages. And so I was, um, in a, I was basically moving into a lot of these towns just after the regime uh, forces had just left these areas. And so there was one town in particular that I had entered maybe four hours after the regime tanks had left. And um, it was, a uh, pretty terrible sight. There was, um, the buildings were still smoking. There was bodies on the streets. Uh, the regime forces had gone into this town and had gone house to house and pulled men, women, and children outside and summarily executed them. And so I was trying to, I was reporting at the time. So I was trying my best to try to get all the details. And uh, beyond just the horror of what I had seen, I, I noticed that in this town, there were five families and almost all of the victims, about I think like 80 or 85 victims, were from one of the five families. So I tried at the time to understand why that was the case. Why would it be that the regime who is employing indiscriminate violence was oddly discriminate in this case and mostly attacking a single family out of five? And I asked people, I didn't really get a good explanation of it, um, but it, it kind of gnawed at me and, I, and I, it kept in my mind. So later, it's probably like six months or eight months later, when I returned to that area in Idlib, um, I tried to do a little bit more digging. And it turned out that this one family that had been a victim of this massacre, they had 40 years earlier or 30 years earlier at that point uh, in, the, in the 80s had, uh, had members who had joined the Muslim Brotherhood. And so there was clearly uh, a sense among the regime soldiers that this was a reprisal for, not just for what was happening now in 2011, but also a reprisal for what had happened between 1979 and 1982. Uh, and then I tried to do more interviews over the course of the next year. And uh, it turned out that this one family who had members in the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the reason they had uh, members in the Brotherhood, as opposed to the other four families, which did not, was went back even further to the 40s and 50s. This was a land-owning family. Uh, they had huge plantations, some, almost a quasi-feudal system that they were um, they were on top of. And in 1958, when um, Nasser had taken over Syria effectively. Uh, the, uh, he undertook nationalizations of uh, a lot of land and he redistributed land to the poor. And uh, this family was one of the families that actually lost a lot of land in that. So, and then they turned towards the brotherhood in the 50s and 60s. And then in the 80s, they joined the insurgency against the Syrian government. And then in 2011, their sons had joined the insurgency. And interestingly, in 2011 and 12, none of the people I spoke to identified as Muslim Brotherhood. They identified as the Free Syrian Army. They were more or less secular, or you might even call liberal. But that legacy actually mattered uh, tremendously for the, the sort of the, the way in which the conflict unfolded. So it was kind of an important lesson for me 
in that you can look at the Syrian conflict as an extraordinarily chaotic conflict, which it was. I think at the height of the conflict, there was something like a thousand or 1500 factions all around the country. Um, there was maybe six, seven, eight uh, regional powers and international powers that are intervening in the country. And it's easy to just look at all that and try to throw your hands up and say that this is inordinately complicated and there's no logic behind it. But uh, what that incident kind of uh, indicated to me is that this civil war, like any civil war, does have a logic underlying it. And that's really was the motivating, uh, that was the, the motivation behind what we wanted to do in this study, which is try to understand some of the logics behind uh, this very complicated war. And we had, in doing that, we, we had the aim of trying to answer three main questions. The first question is uh, that, as most people know, the Syrian opposition was very fragmented. And um, it was always a question from 2012 to the end of the revolution. Could the opposition unite? Could they uh, become cohesive? And, um, you know, as I said, there's up to 1,000 or 1,500 factions. Most, and there was brief moments where they united in various formations. But at the end of the day, they were very fragmented. Why? Why were they so fragmented? That's the first question we were interested in. The second question was, even within that sort of landscape of fragmentation, there were some groups that were more cohesive and some groups are less cohesive. For example, Ahrar al-Sham, the Islamist group, you could argue was one of the most cohesive organizations in the Syrian conflict. Uh, you know, they had a cadre that was a leadership. Uh, they were a national organization. They had members stretching from one end of Syria to the other end of Syria. They all kind of believed in a common aim and a common vision. So that was on the more cohesive side. On the other hand, at the other extreme, you had uh, the various uh, local factions that were operating under the, the label or the brand of the Free Syrian Army. And these are very um, sort of non-cohesive, you know, often, you know, every single town had their own faction or had multiple factions. And there was little to tie these factions together, except for a common flag and some common language about, say, democracy and freedom. Uh, but there was no command and control that was actually uniting all of these. So the second question we want to understand is why was there a variation in the fragmentation patterns inside the Syrian conflict? And the third question, and probably the ultimate question was, you know, why did the, the, the war take the, the trajectory that it did take, uh, which was it started with peaceful protests, muta mutated or morphed into an armed insurrection, led to thousands of factions, led to dozens of countries intervening, and led to a situation in which the ultimate aims um, from 2011 to 2012 were not met by the revolution. So the paper is, uh, was done in, is in the spirit of trying to, not to answer these questions, because these are really complicated questions and it's not like our paper has all the answers to that, but rather to try to gesture towards ways in thinking about how we might be able to answer these questions uh, with additional research. So that's the, that's the sort of broad overview of the paper. Now you'll notice in describing this, um, you know, I've, I've focused a bit on some, what's happened pre-2011, which is, you know, for example, I mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood, et cetera. And so this is something that runs through this paper, which is the idea that uh, the world pre-2011 actually is quite important in understanding the world post-2011. On one level, that's uh, admittedly an obvious point, right? That any, any society you study, you have to look at the, the conditions, the social context. But in, uh, on another level, I, I, we felt that there was also a bit of an understudied uh, subject. Um, to look at two, two aspects of the pre-2011 life that we think shaped the trajectory of the conflict post-2011, one is uh, social networks. By social networks, I don't mean like uh, Facebook and Twitter. I, I mean, um, the ways in which people were connected to each other, um, for example, through kinship, you know, if you're uh, family members, through tribal affiliation, through being from the same town, maybe being from the same high school, uh, coming, you know, participating in the same football club, soccer club, you know, all of these are ways in which people have formed links with each other. And, and this type of social network, of course, is important anywhere at all times in, around the world, but especially important in the, in the conditions, of, uh, conditions of dictatorship, which was uh, Syria, where trust was really important. If you look at the 2011 to 2012 period where people had to really take extraordinary risks to go out onto the streets and, and demonstrate, um, 
being able to trust the people who, who called you to do those demonstrations was paramount, right? So uh, when we talk about social networks in this paper, what we mean very specifically is networks of trust that enable collective action. So uh, ways in which people can work together through their trust to go out and do something collectively, whether it's go engage in a protest or take up weapons and fight the government, what, what have you. So social networks is one aspect that we try to really focus on in this paper to try to understand the post-2011 trajectory. The second aspect that we really tried to focus on was class. And by class, I don't necessarily just mean income level, though that's important course, but also by class, we mean uh, your profession and the ways in which your profession both influences your worldview and the way you see what's around you and influences the types of social networks you engage in. So uh, an example of this would be uh, if you compare two, two groups that are in, in sort of relative terms wealthy to their local constituents, which would be um, merchants in cities and tribal sheikhs in, in the countryside. Both of them are relatively wealthy. Um, so on income levels, they may be in some cases similar, um, but we would say they're probably different classes because uh, they engage with each other and form social networks in, in different ways. And so we talk a bit about merchant networks um, in the paper because it turns out to be a very important uh, aspect to how the subsequent conflict uh, evolved. So the point is, these are two ways, and they're, these are not the only two ways. There's many other ways one can look at the conflict and many other social um, ways of interaction that, that need to be studied further. We decided to focus on these two um, to try to understand what happened after 2011. Okay, so the, 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 the last point on understanding what happened after 2011 is to try to uh, really contend or to, to, to engage with this point that if you look at the 40 year dictatorship of the Assad family until 2011, um, there's many ways you can describe that dictatorship. But one way you can describe the dictatorship is that it was an unremitting assault on civil society um, or on political life on, and on um, associational life, right? The Assad dictator, dictatorship was an assault on this and a continuous assault on this. So certain groups, certain social networks are, were better able to su survive this assault than other social networks were able to, to do so, okay? And so we go through in the paper various types of social networks and, and highlight those that were able to, to some extent, survive this assault and others that which were completely not able to survive this assault. So I wanna just very quickly run through some of these, uh, these social, these networks, uh, these networks, we call them networks of solidarity in the paper. So of, of all the networks of solidarity, the one that was the most able to survive the, the, the uh, full on assault of uh, the Assad regime on civil society was the Muslim Brotherhood. So the Muslim Brotherhood emerged in the 40s and 50s in Syria. They were closely tied to the wealthy and particularly to the landholding elite and to merchants, to souk traders and others. Um, for reasons which I won't, I won't describe here, but you can, you can look, look into in the paper, uh, the um, this Muslim Brotherhood was always kind of a wealthy, wealthier phenomenon. In the late 70s, early 80s, um, they were related to or part of an insurgency against the Assad regime. And after 1982, they were more or less eradicated as a formal organization inside Syria. But they were not eradicated as an informal organization. And what I mean by that is that, you know, maybe the actual card carrying members were thrown in jail or they were killed or they fled the country. Uh, but, you know, they had relatives, they had brothers, they had sons, they had daughters, they had others who, in various ways, either um, kind of kept up the, that social network. Uh, and at the same time, many of those members of the Brotherhood who fled the country, uh, as I said, they were already wealthier, they were merchants, um, they opened up businesses around the Arab world. And what developed over the next 20, 30 years was a network of merchants who are trading with each other. Uh, and this uh, laid the groundwork for a relatively cohesive social network that could survive the onslaught on civil society that the that this, uh, Assad regime was able to put, put, put onto uh, Syria. So that's at the one extreme of like the most uh, cohesive uh, networks. In between you have uh, Salafi groups. These Salafi groups generally emerged from the Muslim Brotherhood. 
uh, they were different from the Muslim Brotherhood in their theology and in their politics. Um, and we get into distinctions between various types just very quickly. Uh, there, had those, there were those Salafi groups that were uh, opposed or not, if not opposed, independent of the Saudi government, the Saudi state, and others that were aligned to or defending the Saudi state. Uh, we call them activists and loyalist Salafis in the paper. Um, then you had um, going down the list of like, you know, social networks that are able to withstand uh, the uh, regime's onslaught on civil society. Then you had tribal groups, tribal, tribal networks everywhere are kind of fragmentary because they depend on patronage from states. And this is also the case in Syria. And now if we go to the least uh, cohesive network that emerged out of the 40 year dictatorship um, is what we call liberals. Now by liberals, I don't mean liberals in the narrow sense that we in America use liberals as in like socially liberal or democratic party. I mean, liberals in the broader enlightenment sense uh, of the term for, you know, emphasizing freedom, demo, uh, freedom of uh, assembly and freedom of speech, et cetera, right? Now liberals in Syria tended to be middle-class professionals like teachers or lawyers, et cetera. And it's instructive to compare them to the Muslim Brotherhood because liberals in Syria didn't really have these kinds of networks that connected one another to each other. Um, you know, if you're a liberal lawyer from some town in Idlib, there's, there's no real way you're gonna be connected to some liberal lawyer in, in let's say Duma or Daraya, okay? So liberals are fragmented um, already from the, fr fr by the very nature of the, their, their ideology in pre-2011 Syria, unlike the Muslim Brotherhood, which had been built on networks of traders that had survived. So with all that being said, when the foreign powers began to intervene, and they didn't really begin to intervene until early 2012, for the most part, um, they, de they decided to back various sides based on their own internal political demands and, and, and constraints. So on the one hand, you had a Qatar who has, for reasons we described in the paper, had some historic ties both to the Muslim Brotherhood and to a version of Salafism that was independent of or sometimes opposed to the Saudi state. Now, when they wanted to back a horse in the Syrian race, they, it was, they already had, um, they had groups that were somewhat cohesive and well capitalized because they were merchants. And as a result, they, um, when they did force ties with these groups, and in some cases they had pre-existing ties, you know, many ex-Brotherhood members moved to Qatar in the eighties and nineties and had businesses there, et cetera. So this became a proxy client relationship that was quite effective. Now, on the other hand, you had the United States and Saudi Arabia and Jordan and others who um, for various reasons wanted to avoid supporting the Salafis, let's say, or uh, the types of Salafis are opposed to the Saudi state. And so they were left with tribal groups and liberals who were already fragmented coming into 2011. So, and already um, they, they weren't from the same class background as the Muslim Brotherhood. So not well capitalized and fragmented. So already they're, they're backing a horse that is not very cohesive and is not going to be able to um, exert strong command and control. So, that is our argument for why different sides, uh, different regional powers supported different local actors and why that led to um, subsequent, you know, varying or divergent trajectories. So maybe I'll stop there and throw it to Jeremy, who's going to talk about how that played out in the city of Mimbej as a case study, which maybe will put some meat on the bones of what I just said. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Anand. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Jeremy Hodge. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors or the co-author uh, to Anand on this paper. Um, before uh, getting into details about Membej, um, I did want to zoom out just a little bit uh, to address another section of our paper that talks about uh, the 20 year period uh, of domestic politics in both Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, 20 years prior to the Arab Spring in 2011. Um, as Anand mentioned, uh, and as is commonly known, Saudi Arabia and Qatar were the largest and most influential, though of course not the only patrons of the Syrian opposition uh, post-2011, um, that uh, had very different domestic experiences uh, in the 20 year period before 2011 that influenced how they viewed the region outside their borders, um, what they perceived to be a threat to be, to be a threat to their own interests, 
uh, and who they viewed uh, in turn as appropriate proxies to adopt as uh, clients uh, in a conflict zone such as Syria. Um, a non alluded to the differences between loyalist Salafists and activist Salafists, uh, and that's another important, important part of our paper um, because uh, oftentimes when we think of the GCC, we think of kind of a monolithic block of stable, rich countries, uh, similar to the EU or other rich parts of the world. But of course, uh, each country uh, is different, obviously, and each one is kind of beset with its own internal cleavages that influence its foreign policy. In the case of Saudi Arabia, um, Saudi Arabia experienced comparatively much more internal uh, turmoil than other GCC member states in the 20 years prior to the Arab Spring. Uh, the first uh, example of this would be what was called the Safa movement between 1991 and 1995, which was the first kind of uh, grassroots uh, mass protest movement within Saudi Arabia uh, that called for increased democratization, liberalizing political institutions, and even to a lesser extent, uh, federal, a, a type of federal jobs guaranteed to recent graduates from local religious institutes who were facing a contracted drop, job market at the time due to uh, uh, contracting economy and low oil prices. Um, the Sahwa protest movement was triggered in 91 by the establishment of US military bases in Saudi Arabia. However, uh, after it was kind of uh, crushed in 95 by the Saudi state, as an on diluted, they're kind of, it kind of forced a wedge within Salafism between those who were in many instances literally called activist Salafists in that they adopted Muslim Brotherhood style ideas regarding reform and activism as a means of reforming or in some instances overthrowing governments that they uh, oppose. Uh, and those who remained loyal to the Saudi state who uh, have since been referred to as quietest Salafists or loyalist Salafists. Um, this division played out throughout the region. Uh, Qatar uh, became obviously the Saudi state, uh, arrested the vast majority of the activists and uh, a small portion of that uh, activist community uh, merged with other groups to form what we now know to be uh, jihadist Salafism, which uh, I think is, doesn't require much of an explanation. Um, but uh, in, in Qatar, uh, well, so I was, there was the Sahel movement in the early 90s. Later, uh, in, from 2002 to 2006, um, this isn't often discussed, but Saudi Arabia experienced its own uh, violent al-Qaeda inspired insurgency in the country for four years that killed about 200 people and injured another 500. Um, so Saudi Arabia in this period experienced a lot of internal turmoil. Qatar on the other hand is a very small country, uh, has never experienced really any of these problems. Uh, Qatar has never uh, in recent history had a massive uh, protest movement for democratization. Qatar has never witnessed a, a violent insurgency within its borders um, reasons for that are, are somewhat obvious. It's a much smaller country, very uh, rich, amongst the richest countries in the world in terms of per capita GDP. Um, however, what we do know obviously is that the main threat that Qatar does or has traditionally faced, uh, as opposed to ground up grassroots threats has been top down threats, mostly in the form of coups uh, carried out by factions of the royal family sometimes or failed coup attempts, oftentimes with the support of Saudi Arabia and other GCC nations. Um, that being said, by 2011, both countries were in very different places in terms of who they were willing to dole out patronage to in a conflict zone such as Syria. Obviously, Saudi Arabia was very hesitant to uh, encourage anybody who uh, you know, uh, discussed uh, democratization in any way or might provide a safe haven for the type of jihadist movement that Saudi Arabia itself witnessed within its borders between 2002 and 2006. Qatar, on the other hand, its top priority was to antagonize Saudi Arabia to a certain extent. And so a sort of enemy of my enemy is my friend dynamic was established. And as a result, Qatar was eager very, on, very early on to um, promote activist Salafists, provide refuge within its own borders to Sahwa activists that had been repressed in Saudi Arabia. Um, and then in a place like Syria, as Anon mentioned, develop ties with groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist groups uh, like Tabligh al-Dawah and uh, Hizb al-Tahrir and others. Um, so the, I think it's, it's important to understand those competing motivations uh, for each country um, by 2011. Um, now, Anand also talked about uh, the difference between, for example, urban rural merchant communities uh, and tribal sheikhs as two distinct kind of cohorts within Syria. 
the Saudi cutlery divide actually very neatly, uh, not entirely clean cut, but very neatly mapped out sort of onto that internal divide that already existed within Syria as well. So um, Saudi Arabia, obviously, because of its large land mass and his, uh, you know, historical ties to neighboring countries, um, was very close with many of these tribal networks that Anand had mentioned, um, simply through kinship. Many tribal leaders or sheikhs in Syria um, were related to tribal leaders in Saudi Arabia or had been part of, uh, or historically before the formation of modern nation states had, um, had been part of the same tribal confederations in Saudi Arabia up until 2011 maintained ties uh, to a lot of these Syrian tribes. Um, Qatar obviously being farther away didn't have these tribal links to these groups, but because of the dynamics that I just described, kind of bypassed the tribes and established ties via the Muslim Brotherhood uh, to Syria's merchant urban uh, community uh, farther north, northwest uh, in, a, in, in the urban centers, many of whom were close with the Muslim Brotherhood. So on the one hand, we have sociological distinctions between tribal communities uh, in the countryside in places like Eastern and Southern Syria and more urban communities uh, that are deracinated and non-tribal in Northern, Northwestern Syria and, you know, and other areas, Damascus and elsewhere. But this also kind of evolved into a political um, distinction as well. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood was not very, did not penetrate a lot of areas where uh, Saudi Arabia traditionally had influence in tribal regions. Um, and so, you know, perhaps as a result of fate or also just coincidence, by the time 2011 arrived, Saudi Arabia and Qatar had two very different motivations for sponsoring different groups, but also their pre-existing ties with groups in Syria were also coincidentally divided along sociological and political lines. Um, that played out, and we addressed in our paper ways in which that played out throughout the country. Um, our, the case study that we present in the paper is a city called Membej, as Anand mentioned. Uh, Membej is a town of 100,000 people in eastern Aleppo province. Um, it was part of, it was liberated in, by the Free Syrian Army uh, in July 2012 as part of a massive push by Qatari-backed groups, uh, mostly affiliated with a, a faction called Liwel Tawhid, which literally means uh, uh, unity brigade, brigade or monotheist brigade was the largest uh, faction in mid 2012 that was backed directly by Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood. Membej was liberated by uh, armed groups affiliated with Liwel Tawhid at around the time that many other areas were liberated. Um, however, on a micro scale, if you look at Membej itself, the same rural and urban divisions applied uh, in that city that also one could witness zooming out uh, you know, throughout the rest of the country. Um, and similarly, uh, we had a cohort of uh, urban, urbanized, provincial, uh, deracinated, non-tribal elites within Membej that were colloquially re referred to as Hadron, which kind of means uh, civilized, that this is kind of the connotation, civilized or just urban. Um, and then a kind of smattering of uh, poorer, less well-educated, uh, rural tribal uh, groups um, that lived kind of on the periphery of society that had not been involved in the merchant class that similarly did not have uh, pre-existing ties to Liwel Tawhid or the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, after liberation, these two divides very much diverged from one another and a very intense uh, intra-revolutionary uh, competition took place between the Hadrani uh, provincial elite that was kind of that had merchant ties to, to Muslim Brotherhood groups elsewhere that was affiliated with the Royal Tawhid and armed Free Syrian army factions that were provincial and rural. Um, as Anand alluded to, the, uh, the former, the, uh, the Hadrani elites in Membej city were much more cohesive and uh, had much more capital at their disposal and were tapped into uh, foreign donor networks abroad that enabled them to kind of not entirely monopolized power, however, very quickly seized the reins as the, govern, the governing authority within Membej. Um, so the Membej Revolutionary Council um, was basically a governing project set up by leaders uh, within the, uh, within the uh, Hadrani urbanized elite. Um, they elected, there was obviously a, uh, the Membej Revolutionary Council had an executive body that was divided uh, between uh, 
in cabinet positions, one could argue, they set up a makeshift parliament, which included about two to 300 representatives. Although accusations were often launched that the makeshift parliament body was disproportionately representative of that urban elite and kind of excluded members of uh, the rural tribal community. Uh, there was also a, a military council established by uh, the Mehmed Revolutionary Council that mostly comprised three armed factions uh, that drew their, uh, their soldiers mostly from, again, that urban community and also to a lesser extent, elements of, the, uh, of a local tribe known as the Elbu Sultan tribe that also had a, traditionally a lot of, um, a large population, much of its population had also been urbanized. Um, that being said, so the, the urban population was much more cohesive. It was much better able to establish its authority early on. Uh, meanwhile, the rural community was very disunited. Um, it did not have access early on to that uh, Qatari Muslim Brotherhood uh, funding stream. And as a result, uh, unfortunately, um, resorted mostly to banditry to, um, to fund itself. I apologize, one second, I, my battery may uh, be low, just give me one second, hold on. Okay. Um, well, apologies, everybody. Anyways, um, that being said, um, this kind of division played out, I'd say for about a year after um, liberation uh, until the arrival of ISIS, uh, when ISIS, uh, basically allied itself with elements of the uh, rural tribal community that had been somewhat marginalized in order to gradually take over uh, infrastructure within Mehmed City before finally launching a pullout military assault on the city and taking control of it and expelling the Mehmed Revolutionary Council in January of 2014. Um, as I mentioned a second ago, uh, the urban cohort had its uh, was backed largely uh, by a lucrative stream of funding from Qatar. The rural cohort was much more forced to become self-sufficient and fund itself through criminality, uh, kidnapping, banditry, and these types of things. Um, however, one means of self-financing that these kind of marginal rural cohorts were able to engage in was uh, manipulation of local bread markets. Um, and so, one armed faction that kind of came to rival the Membed Revolutionary Council in this area uh, was a faction called Luwajim al Haramain, which means the, uh, the uh, brigade of the two holy mosques in reference to uh, the two holy mo mosques in Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia. Um, Luwajim al Haramain was able to uh, take control of key grain silos uh, just outside of Membed, uh, take over by force many private bakeries that sold bread in the area um, and through typical tactics of hoarding supplies um, and you know, driving prices up was able to, uh, well, on the one hand finance itself but also rival the Membed Revolutionary Council in many ways. Uh, oftentimes setting up parallel court systems, um, uh, parallel court systems and also service provision in some instances. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, there, there was a, a very clear Saudi Qatari divide that mapped out fairly neatly uh, onto the rural urban divide within Membej. Uh, the legend of Haramain very quickly, um, after it was unable to tap into funding from the Royal Tawheed, did manage to cultivate a very lucrative relationship uh, with a Saudi uh, financier by the name of Hamoud al Faraj, who was based in a uh, uh, it's a more southern town called Tabqa, which was a very uh, tribal yet um, very pro-revolutionary uh, area of Syria around Lake Assad. Um, the Tabqa region also witnessed a lot of Free Syrian Army activity against the regime. Um, and this region, because of the tribal ties that I mentioned between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, traditional tribal leaders in this area, uh, they had their own competing funding stream from Saudi Arabia that came in. Uh, Liwa Jindal Haramain, because uh, it was unable to access Qatari funds, very quickly started branching out and looking elsewhere and was able to 
perhaps through tribal solidarity or mutual networks established ties to the, uh, the Saudi funding stream that was coming into the city of Tabqa via uh, a leading tribal sheikh named Hamoud al-Faraj that I mentioned. Um, and so by the time that this happened, which was in kind of mid-2012, um, the kind of Qatari Saudi divide that existed throughout the country, whereby Qatar had its own sort of not geographical sphere of influence, but sociological sphere of influence amongst the urban uh, provincial uh, uh, merchant elite, basically. Um, and Saudi Arabia had, on the other hand, uh, its sphere of influence sociologically amongst the kind of rural tribal cohorts. This kind of was solidified on a granular level within Membej by late 2012. Um, uh, this division, I mean, in the paper, we also uh, discuss furthermore, you know, the, the historical roots of this urban rural divide within Membej city itself. Um, as Anand mentioned, you know, with the example that he gave, uh, the history that separates these two cohorts goes back, you know, many, many decades. Um, in Membej, during the French mandate period, before the city of Membej itself was really built up, uh, tribal sheikhs, particularly from the Al-Bubenna and the host tribes, um, were kind of the, the main, if not only, real power in the area. Uh, the Membej city was still very small, and tribal sheikhs owned most of the land in the area. Um, and they were very close with the French authorities who uh, enabled them to amass large land holdings. Um, after independence uh, and, uh, and you know, a, a phase of urbanization that took place, um, Membed City itself grew and you saw this merchant class emerge um, and the uh, matriculation of families into the city who kind of began to shed their tribal identity and become known as this Hadrani cohort that was uh, that it was not really, that didn't derive its, its wealth from land holdings as much as it did commerce, um, and particularly the real estate sector was very lucrative for a lot of these families. From the, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, this Hadrani cohort, in addition to a section of the, like I mentioned, the Albu Sultan tribe that was in the city, uh, they kind of outstripped the traditional tribal leadership, um, and they were able to kind of monopolize political positions within Membed City, um, in addition to a lot of the commerce uh, and uh, commerce that occurred, in, in addition to state patronage. So, you know, through uh, political positions and holding on to these positions, state patronage also flowed to this urban merchant cohort. With the rise of leftist parties throughout Syria in the 1950s and 60s, but then especially uh, with the rise of Hafez al-Assad in 1970, the situation flipped once again. Uh, where, so that um, the regime began to, number one, it stripped the al Sultan tribe of its uh, monopoly on political, on powerful political positions and gave them exclusively to members of the al Bubenna and Hosh tribes. You know, very, uh, well, one very uh, noteworthy example is the parliamentarian Mohammed Deeb al Mashi, who literally holds the Guinness Book of World Records as the longest serving parliamentarian in the history of all parliaments throughout the entire world. Um, Mohammed Deeb al Mashi was uh, leader of the Al Bubenna tribe. Again, this is a rural, uh, traditional landowning tribe, not the merchant cohort. Um, Abu Mohammed Deeb al Mashi, I think, was uh, appointed uh, an uh, MP from Membej in 1955, I believe, and he held that position until his death in 2009. So for 54 years, uh, Mohammed Deeb al Mashi from the Abu Bena tribe, not, he was the only parliamentarian from, from Membej. And of course, when he died, his son simply inherited the position. There were, so that's the, the parliamentary position. However, there were other positions, such as uh, the position of mayor, Bath Party local Bath Party secretariat, um, and others that were yeah. similarly monopolized by individual families from the traditional rural tribal cohort. Um, what turn a bit to. Um... Elizabeth, and we can return to the deep dive on. Sure, yeah. But make sure we also get some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, uh, thank you for, for this opportunity to, to respond to, to this uh, to the support, um, which is really a significant contribution to the study of the Syrian civil war. 
um, I think that uh, there is uh, a great need for such research, um, particularly since um, Syria at the same time is the most uh, well-documented civil war in history. Um, and yet at the same time, so much information uh, remains uh, unknown, remains uncovered. So this is really an excellent piece of work and I highly recommend the, uh, those are, uh, you know, listening to us and watching us to, to take the time to read it. Um, so uh, there are several points that I wanted to mention in response to the paper and uh, the, the comments uh, made earlier by the, by the authors. Um, so, I, I, you know, uh, early on in the, in the history of the, of the Civil War, as uh, Anand mentioned, uh, there was uh, a great deal of division between, um, between different factions. Uh, and um, the, despite a great deal of frustration from the population, these uh, divisions uh, did, not, uh, did not mend. Um, multiple efforts to merge factions into uh, kind of united bodies, such as the Syrian Islamic Front, uh, Syrian Liberation Front, uh, proved unsuccessful. And um, I think this, um, uh, uh, this paper really shows well the role of foreign actors in, uh, in ensuring that these divisions uh, remain, essentially. Uh, of course, there's also the important effect of the legacy of living under a Ba'ath regime that destroyed uh, civil society, uh, prevented the uh, existence of kind of a, a public space and worked very hard to crush uh, pre-existing networks in society um, uh, or co-opt them. And, uh, and therefore it was hard to cohere into uh, a united force, whether military or a political one, uh, because of a great deal of distrust between people um, because of, of that legacy of living under a regime that deployed, you know, tens of thousands uh, of uh, agents to spy and write reports about other people. Um, I think that the um, that this focus on social networks also uh, provides us uh, with an understanding as to why the officers who defected from the Syrian army were really kind of unable to uh, uh, gain a significant foothold and influence over the armed opposition. Uh, they, in most cases, uh, became kind of uh, figureheads uh, and constantly expressed deep frustration uh, about, uh, you know, not being listened to, not being included, not being put in high positions that they thought that they deserved. Uh, they blame much of the failure of the opposition to them not being included. And this was actually quite a common perception. And this paper really explains why, because they were not part of these networks. Uh, they were outside of those networks for the most part, some were inside tribal networks, but for sure they were outside of the Muslim Brotherhood networks, outside of the Salafi networks, uh, and therefore were really uh, not relevant uh, in most cases in the uh, armed, uh, armed rebellion. And even now, for example, Turkish efforts to uh, in place these uh, defected officers into the national army, the proxy force that is in control of northern Aleppo, uh, th those efforts have been largely unsuccessful. And basically, these officers are not able to override pre existing networks and loyalty that was created to commanders of specific factions uh, who are people with no, in most cases, with no prior military experience or uh, they're not defected officers, basically. They were traders, they were. Uh, thieves, uh, they were not um, these high ranking uh, defected officers. Um, I think um, the, the issue uh, that Anand pointed to of, of, of social networks of trust is incredibly important. And I think this is why, in addition to the regime's policy of releasing Salafis out of prison, uh, we see this uh, very strong cohesion of Ahrar al-Sham, but also other factions uh, whose members uh, like Jesh al-Islam uh, and also Jabhat al-Nusra to some extent bonded in prison. When you uh, create that connection with people, I mean, even the regime is not cruel enough 
to put people inside prison and torture them for years just for them to be informers. So basically, when you create that network in prison, you have that trust. And, you know, Ahrar al-Sham was able to withstand, you know, uh, losing so much territory, um, uh, the assassination of all of its leadership and persist uh, because of these very, very strong networks of trust uh, that existed. And this is why I think we also see the significant role of tribes uh, in, uh, in rebellions in rural areas, in, in, in Dara'a, in, uh, in Deir Zor, in Hasake, uh, where really the division was uh, along tribal lines. And this is something that we also see, by the way, with uh, pro-regime uh, militias of major families or, or, or clans and tribes um, um, kind of uh, being linked into uh, populating uh, specific uh, militias. Um, I think that um, what's really interesting um, in uh, kind of the ranking that Anand offered with regards to the um, success of various networks in posing a threat to the regime uh, and their level of cohesion, it is actually very much in line with the regime's threat perception. So the regime actually had a very good assessment of who poses a danger to it. So if we look at the kind of least threatening group, liberal, right? They were sidelined, you know, very, very quickly, never able to cohere into any kind of military networks and arguably not even civilian networks, you know, and, and, and this is not to, to blame them, but it just, they did not have any space to operate. Uh, many of the tansiqiyat of the, the local coordination committees, which these liberals populated, um, really, um, you know, kind of relied on networks uh, that a lot of them were created online with people who did not even know each other's real names. There was constant fear of, of hacking, of surveillance, of people uh, of, of just not knowing uh, with whom you're speaking. Um, so these groups were actually, some of them were allowed to operate. Um, you know, the regime knew who some of these people are, but did not perceive them, um, you know, threatening enough to even arrest them. Yes, some of them were occasionally arrested, but some were allowed to operate. Uh, you know, they campaigned for women's issues. Some of them did riskier work on behalf of uh, dissidents of political uh, detainees. Uh, but uh, largely, these people were allowed to uh, to operate. Um, and, and this, by the way, also includes kind of the intellectual elite, poets and people like that who were allowed to meet, who were allowed to read poetry, because they were not perceived to be uh, a real threat to the regime. Um, then we have the tribes, who some of whom were, uh, I mean, largely before the, the uprising, they were co-opted by the regime, or at least the leadership. The leadership that was installed was leadership that was co-opted by the regime, was cooperating with the regime, um, uh, kind of more traditional leaders that may have enjoyed greater legitimacy were sidelined uh, and people put in place who uh, could facilitate, um, 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 you know, patronage from the regime uh, in the form of jobs and particularly the issue of getting uh, people out of prison, uh, just uh, any kind of uh, handling with the mukhabarat and with the uh, police, uh, or even on, on, on criminal matters. Um, so those networks were allowed to, to operate. Uh, tribes were, you know, there was no effort to like crush the existence of these tribes, but they were uh, co-opted and allowed to continue to exist. Um, then we have the Salafis, uh, with wh whom the regime treated in a very kind of instrumental way. So uh, uh, occasionally it would deploy them, you know, it would assist them in going to Iraq after the American invasion in 2003, um, and implanted uh, quite uh, prominent members of the Mukhabarat or, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, made people in, that, in those spaces switch sides to the regime and provide it with information about those people going to, uh, going to Iraq and people meeting inside um, the country and uh, you know, learning Al-Qaeda literature, et cetera. So these people were occasionally used 
uh, by the regime. They were used, uh, sent to Iraq. And then after the start of the uprising, they were used again by being released out of prison uh, to basically facilitate the process of turning the revolution into what the regime claimed that it is, which is a, a Salafist uh, armed insurrection. Um, and then the, the, the greatest threat that uh, this paper shows was the Muslim Brotherhood. And the regime, you know, completely outlawed the uh, existence of the group. Uh, membership, membership in the Muslim Brotherhood uh, was punishable by death. It was not, uh, you know, you don't go to prison, you just get executed. Um, and, and indeed, the Muslim Brotherhood did not exist as a political force um, in, in Syria on the eve of the revolution and arguably not even now. Um, but those family networks remained in place. So it actually shows us, I think, this paper that the regime has um, quite a good understanding uh, of, of who poses a threat and who doesn't pose a threat. Um, and then, um, you know, I think the case study of Manbij is, is very interesting. And I think that it would be, you know, I hope that this work is, um, I know that there's more work coming out about Manbij, but I also hope that this theory about um, pre-war networks and uh, the connections to the Gulf, I think it's also something that is very fruitful to apply it, for example, to the, to the area of Der Zor, where um, we re there's a significant difference between the history of the armed factions in the eastern countryside of Deir Ezzor and the western countryside of Deir Ezzor. Whereas in western countryside of Deir Ezzor, many, many uh, young men in, in, in that area would travel to Lebanon to work in agriculture, uh, while eastern Deir Ezzor uh, would travel to the Gulf uh, and then sometimes return with new ideas. Uh, and we really see eastern Deir Ezzor em emerging as a hotbed of uh, protests initially at the start of the uprising, and then of the armed, uh, of the armed revolt against the regime. Um, um, the uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, the, the fighters who entered Syria, uh, first came to Dhar, a town in the eastern countryside of Dhar Zor, from which they, uh, near the town of Shahir, from which they uh, really took over uh, much of uh, much of the resort until they were kicked out by uh, by ISIS, who also relied very heavily on um, on basically the uh, a subsection of the Al Aqidat tribe, uh, Al Kair, who are also from the eastern uh, countryside of the resort. While the area of the western countryside was much more quietest, they didn't have those. Uh, pre-revolutionary uh, Salafi networks embedded uh, in this area. So uh, again, I urge all the people who are tuning in to read this paper. It's, it's truly fantastic and worth your time. Thanks all. Um, we'll now turn to your questions. Please submit them via the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. So one question that we have here um, is, what does this mean today now that we're um, a decade into this conflict that's been shaped by these various social networks? Um, can you talk a bit about what this theory would project forward for the next couple of years, um, if not decade, that's probably a bit too much. And as the ranking, as your ranking of um, which of these social networks is most capable of um, challenging the regime or even being successful where the regime is not um, exerting its highest level of power changed after a decade of war. Um, sure, I think um, I can, can I can comment briefly with regards to Membej. Um, one interesting development that I think has taken place since 2016, uh, since the US-backed majority Kurdish Syrian Democratic Forces took Membej from ISIS, um, has kind of been a recreation of the old uh, regime networks that used to exist before 2011. Um, that won't come as a huge shock to many people because it is kind of well known that uh, the YPG or the PYD, which is the main uh, armed Kurdish group operating in Syria, has historically maintained ties to the regime. However, um, this kind of happened um, 
by accident, I guess one could say. Um, after 2016, the, the urban cohort uh, that we had discussed that kind of led the revol revolutionary movement uh, fled to Turkey mostly in mass after ISIS's takeover and was kind of absent from the scene. Um, after the forced removal of ISIS from Membej, um, elements of the rural tribal cohort that had been marginalized that hadn't joined ISIS um, were kind of the only group that was still left in the area um, and were based and were kind of ripe for recruitment by the majority Kurdish SDF and were uh, very eagerly uh, embraced by the SDF. Um, the Wajid al Haramain, the main faction from Membej that opposed the Revolutionary Council that I mentioned, uh, actually still exists um, 10 years later or nine years later. It has, it's one of the few factions that has yet to be dissolved. Uh, and it still draws from the same rural tribal cohort. And I would argue that it's maintained the faction itself, most of its power um, in Membej and the Membej countryside. Um, and that is, so in many instances, and I would say um, in a lot of areas where the, the YPG exists, and you know they, they now control about a third of the country thereabouts, um, many of the old networks have kind of been revived. And in some ways they're stronger, or at least in Membej they are because the urban merchant cohort that we mentioned is mostly no longer around. They're mostly living in exile in Turkey or in, uh, in the Turkish occupied zones in, in Northwestern Syria. Um, so I think that's a, an interesting development in Membej. Um, but with regards to other regions of Syria, I think Elizabeth has done a lot of very interesting research on regime areas. Um, or, uh, and I don't know if either one of you would wanna add anything to that. Well, maybe I'll just quickly just add uh, on that point, uh, Jeremy, uh, it's ve very interesting. If you look at Membej, uh, there was a divide, as, as Jeremy had mentioned in his talk, it was a historic divide between, on the one hand, um, the deracinated urban elite, Khadran, uh, and particular tribe like the Abul Sultan, on the one hand, and uh, the countryside. And, and so it was the former that had been basically the ruling class of Membej in the 40s and 50s. And then when the, the, the Ba'athists came to power, they essentially, and I'm simplifying a little bit, but they basically overthrew that old ruling class and put in a new ruling class that came from the countryside, from Abu Banna and Khosh, okay? So this was the central divide that uh, basically demarcated uh, Membeji politics from 1958 or 1963 until 2011, which is you had most of the important positions of the government uh, occupied by al Banna and Akhosh tribes people from the countryside. And you had the Khadran, the deracinated urban elite, as well as Abu Sultan being kind of marginalized, okay? And what's interesting is 2011 kind of inverted that. Uh, dynamic so that now the revolutionary forces, especially the Revolutionary Council, which was the most important body in the revolution, was predominantly comprised of Abu Sultan tribes people and the Khadran. Okay, and the Khadran, as Jeremy mentioned, were gravitating towards the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, 2016, uh, the SDF, uh, the US backed SDF, comes in and uh, liberates Mimish from ISIS, and they just invert it again back to the status quo ante in some ways, in some ways, um, because now you have um, the uh, Albu Sultan and the, the, uh, the Khadran expelled from Mimbej. They're now in the Euphrates shield and uh, territories, and they're the ones who are being backed by Turkey uh, as the anti-SDF forces. And in inside Mimbej, you have um, people drawn from the Khosh al Banna, for example, Jundu Harmain, which is a faction that had many of its members from uh, the Abu Banna tribe. So in an, another way of looking at all this is that, is that there was a central divide in Mimbej for 50, 60 years between certain elites uh, and another group of elites who are from the countryside. And they've just switched places um, you know, over the last 40 years. And that explains the SDF's ruling strategy a little bit, is trying to try stabilize their rule by reaching out to those elements that have been marginalized under the 2012 to 2015 period. Uh, but I, I think there's a much more interesting story to say about the regime areas. Elizabeth's really the expert there. I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Um, so I think uh, it's it's a bit difficult to um, cover all regime uh, areas, you know, since the start of the uprising until now. Um, I would say that uh, a trend that is um, 
I would say is very clear uh, throughout the, the process of the of the war on both sides of the uh, opposition and the regime is the growing dominance of uh, rural areas and people from uh, rural backgrounds at the expense of uh, urbanites essentially. Um, and, and, and this is very, very clear uh, in the case of um, you know, the places from which uh, people are being recruited. So uh, you know, the Syrian army, um, uh, basically a, a way that many men use to avoid service is going to, to university. Uh, and this is something that is acceptable, that is uh, accessible uh, much more to people who live in urban areas who had a better educational infrastructure in their areas and just uh, their families are able to afford them, uh, you know, going to university and spending time, uh, spending time studying. Um, and um, while people in the countryside, uh, much a larger share of them than end up joining uh, the Syrian army. Um, but then, uh, with regards to the uh, to the to the militias that the regime uh, very heavy, heavily uh, relies on, uh, those militias really are also um, created through uh, a lot of them through pre-existing uh, networks of patronage that existed in these areas. So this includes, for example, uh, tribal patronage networks. Um, uh, this includes um, criminal networks, essentially. Uh, the Shabiha, a lot of them emerge straight up out of uh, groups that would, uh, would inv be involved, for example, in, in cross-border smuggling into Lebanon. Um, uh, the Beri family in Aleppo city, which uh, is one of the prominent uh, Sunni uh, pro-regime militias, uh, the family engaged in, in criminality, basically, that was their, uh, their source of income. Um, so you really see um, the, the role of networks also, uh, particularly at the start of the mobilization uh, by the regime. Um, however, um, uh, with the continuation of the war, and I think this is something that applies also to the opposition, we see basically all networks um, undergoing significant changes um, for example, the um, uh, Air Force Intelligence uh, used to be just a branch of the Mukhabarat where that would arrest and torture people. Uh, some of the worst torture was exacted there um, and continues to be exacted there. But then it developed basically kind of a, a paramilitary, an armed wing that would go out into um, uh, and conduct battle, not just go out and suppress protesters, but uh, take uh, you know, military action uh, in combination with support from the Air Force, with artillery support. Um, the so-called Tiger Forces uh, uh, were originally a militia of the, um, of the uh, Air Force intelligence and very heavily drawn from particular areas uh, specifically in the, the Hama countryside uh, from towns that are overwhelmingly Alawi, but not exclusively. Some, uh, the town of Kubhana, for example, is a Sunni town, uh, a loyalist town, many who, of uh, whose sons uh, joined, uh, joined that militia. So it's, it's, it's very interesting how the, these networks uh, uh, change themselves over time uh, you know, now many of the fighters that operate in the ranks of uh, all sides are very young. Uh, they're people who are drawn in, into networks that were created during the war on the back, oftentimes, of networks that existed prior to, uh, prior to the war. Thanks. We have a question about, um, you discussed in the paper that the liberal faction was among the weakest, if not the weakest, of the various social networks um, that were being mobilized. Looking forward, what might liberals in Syria learn from this as to um, what they might do differently? And also, um, in the yeah, what might they learn differently from how they approach the conflict for if and when there's another upsurge? of revolutionary or anti-regime activity? 
Uh, I can I can take a stab at this. Uh, I think there's two important lessons uh, which weren't explicit in the paper, but perhaps implicit in the paper, uh, and definitely explicit in other work that we're doing and that I'm doing, which is um, the, fir the first issue, uh, I mean, Jeremy mentioned the issue of bread. Um, one of the, the major mistakes of liberals in the war was, I think, not, was um, putting uh, extraordinary emphasis on certain types of freedoms, such as um, civic freedoms of uh, freedom of assembly and freedom of speech, and uh, not focusing enough on economic security. So Membej is an perfect example of this, where you had essentially between July 2012 and December 2013, 18 months of really a liberal regime, uh, a kind of a local city state that was in, in power there because um, they had overthrown the Syrian regime and were in a kind of participatory democratic experiment. Um, and it was on the one hand, a time of remarkable freedoms. There was, uh, whereas before 2011, there was one or two state newspapers in this period, there was 11 or 12. There were uh, dozens of organizations to Jamaat who are like incipient political parties as far as I'm concerned. Um, so on, looking at it from that perspective, there was extraordinary freedoms uh, that were there. But at the same time, uh, the issue of bread loomed large over everything that was happening. And there were um, there was a section of the Mimbej population, perhaps maybe even the majority, that had been alienated from the Revolutionary Council, which was a ruling or a putative ruling body um, that was comprised mostly of people who are um, liberals, either in word or in deed. And um, the question of bread, the price of bread and social services really took a, sec a, a, a backseat to it. And you can see that I think generally, if you look at the slogans of the Syrian revolution of dignity and freedom compared to those in Egypt, which also said dignity and freedom and bread for, for instance. Um, I think this is a, a, a tragic mistake of the liberals and not paying attention to this sort of uh, key aspect. And, and I think it reflects to an extent the class background of those people who were the liberals who were from the middle class and professionals as opposed to more poor and working class people who also wanted freedom of assembly and expression but wanted also to be able to have freedom from want, freedom from um, you know hunger and uh, other sorts of things. So that I think is an important uh, lesson to be learned. Another lesson that I think should be learned, I'm not sure if it has, is that um, a lot of the liberals that at least that I know and that I've studied in Membej and other areas were very oriented towards a model of politics in which was connected to NGOs. And that meant getting aid from, from without, uh, getting aid from outside. And uh, on the one hand, that's sensible because then you're able to have an organization that can function. But on the other hand, it means that you're ultimately beholden to your donors, not to your political constituency. Um, it's not an accident that uh, al Qaeda in Iraq or ISIS understood very clearly that to build a political constituency, they cannot be beholden to outside, outside forces. This is some, one of Zarqawi's um, epiphanies, probably as early as 2004 in Iraq. And is one of the reasons among others that I think ISIS was successful in, in um, winning over ordinary people away from a liberal program between 2013 and 2014. We have a couple of questions here about um, what the various interests or objectives of um, the foreign patrons or sponsors um, entering the conflict are, including what was the US objective particularly in the early portion of the Obama administration. Um, when there were heavy armor, this question asked, um, I'd add to that also, what is the objective of the US now and how has that changed? And we have another question here about, um, do any of the outside powers intervening have an interest or seeking a unified Syrian Arab state or are they all seeking to intervene on behalf of particular networks, but without a vision for control of the state as a whole? Um, regarding the, the last point first, um, I think the vast majority of uh, states that have or still do intervene in Syria definitely pay lip service to the notion of a unified Syrian state. Um, most, you know, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, 
and the United States and, and other countries, um, including those that one may argue have contributed towards the fractalization of Syria, do uh, in theory want to maintain uh, Syrian, uh, Syria's border integrity and are invested very heavily in the uh, process to redraft the constitution in order to achieve a political solution that brings all powers to the table. Um, in practice, um, I think every patron has their their network and their their group that they have that they have historical ties to, um, and they're probably going to keep relying on that. I think, um, in as I mean, there there are efforts, for example, now to um, kind of reach reconciliation between uh, the Syrian opposition side and the American-backed uh, majority Kurdish SDF side, uh, in order or uh, not not in a way that would uh, unify these areas geographically or create some sort of joint administration, but more so just to agree to a uh, uh, unified interpretation of a potential constitution that could enable both sides to, uh, there's a lot of talk of federalism and all that. Um, but as of now, I think, uh, I mean, in my personal opinion, I think what will probably be the de facto status would be a protracted balkanization of the conflict um, it's proven very hard to uh, reach out across these sides, uh, across these divides, these network divides. Um, and you know, even though there has been there have been echoes of some progress between the opposition and the Kurdish side, which is very, uh, which which is a good omen considering that the opposition is backed by Turkey, which is uh, dead set on um, re reducing to the fullest extent possible the influence of Kurds. I don't think there's been any progress really. Uh, of reaching out between the regime side and the opposition or uh, the Kurdish side. Um, so, I mean, just that was the last question that was addressed. I mean, in terms of, uh, I think most countries pay lip service to, to the notion of a, of a unified Syria, but I think uh, everybody's kind of solidified in their stance, and I doubt that it would be possible to uh, reach across those divides in the near future. Uh, I'll just add quickly to that, that uh, Syria is probably in the worst possible situation because it's a de jure state, but a de facto tripartite state. And um, this cr creates all sorts of problems because you have, for example, the United Nations and it, its aid regime uh, has to go through Damascus. You have, uh, the, if you look at co uh, COVID right now, um, you can't get vac vaccines to northeastern Syria out except through the regime distribution networks. Um, this is a, a real tragedy. And to me, it speaks to a, a broader uh, problem, not just of Syria, but the way but about the way the international state system is set up, where you have all sorts of transnational in, uh, institutions that are set up to deal with states, du jour states. And then you have all these autonomous zones and de facto areas such as Northwest Syria or Northeast Syria, which end up um, suffering uh, because of that. And so even if there were uh, states that wanted or had a vision of uh, a united Syria, let's say, um, the the judicial aspects of what that would mean are so great that it impedes any practical uh, sort of practical effects in, in being able to make that happen. Um, one point that we didn't really or that we hadn't yet addressed was you know how the U.S. position has evolved since from the beginning of the war until now. Um, I think uh, and I think the broad consensus around this was that the U.S. position was mostly one of attempting to facilitate uh, a peaceful uh, stepping down of Bashar al-Assad as president and his inner circle, uh, similar to what occurred in Yemen with Ali Abdullah Saleh. Uh, I don't think the U.S. was ever committed. I mean, I, I think the in the beginning of the war, especially, I think the U.S. position was to try not to get involved to the fullest extent possible. Um, you know, the year that the Arab Spring broke out also coincidentally happened to be the same year that the U.S. withdrew from Iraq. And I think for those of us in the United States, we all know what that, what kind of a headache that was. and. Uh, you know, the role that the Iraq war played in, Ob in Barack Obama's candidacy, not just during the general election, but during the primaries as well, you know, withdrawing from uh, Middle East quagmires was very much part of what drove him uh, to the White House. Um, so I think that was partially, I think in the beginning, there was just definite neglect on the part of the Obama administration. But as it became clear that this was not going to be a, uh, a, a an Arab Spring revolution that would end quickly, I think the goal was a, a facilitated transition that would see Assad removed and you know some sort of political solution that would 
rein in acceptable elements of the opposition. Um, I think that kind of what maintain the, that may state remained the U.S. position up until ISIS um, emerged, and then once ISIS emerged, that, that completely just changed the entire calculus. Um, whereas before, the United States was giving aid and arms to rebel factions ostensibly to fight the Syrian regime. By the time ISIS emerged, pretty much all aid was contingent upon uh, the fact that you had to fight ISIS, and in some instances, you couldn't fight the Syrian regime. Um, this dynamic of ISIS, particularly, I, I mean, this, this could potentially take us down a rabbit hole, but in late 2013 in particular, the issue of aid being tied to fighting ISIS was really in what some ways what drove the rise of ISIS because as ISIS began to emerge little by little, the United States basically clamped down on aid from the Gulf in order to prevent that aid from seeping out and falling into the hands of extremists like ISIS. But at the same time, what happened inadvertently was that aid to what we call the moderate groups also was cut off, which then made it, made it much easier for ISIS to present itself as not only the most powerful body, but the body that, or the powerful party of the conflict, but the party of the conflict best capable of doling out um, aid to local communities. Um, and so in 2013, mid 2013, the United States it's kind of a chicken and the egg type scenario, you know, did the United States reduce, reducing aid lead to ISIS's emergence or facilitate its emergence or did ISIS's emergence lead to the, this debate I think will probably be held endlessly. Um, but then once ISIS took over Mosul and all that, I don't, I think we pretty much gave up on all attempts to uh, remove Assad. I don't think, I think that pretty much ended in terms of, I think one of the most interesting dynamics that has occurred with regards to shifting priorities for nation states is the shift in the Turkish position. So Turkey, I think, was very legitimately committed to the uh, violent overthrow of the Assad regime, not necessarily a negotiated uh, political solution that saw Assad as in a sort of step down. I think Turkey, along with Qatar, in those two countries in particular, were very committed to violently overthrowing Assad by any means. And uh, if we're being honest, just uh, directing aid to a lot of sort of radical groups towards achieving that end. But in response to the rise of ISIS and the US in turn supporting the Kurds and then the establishment of a large Kurdish area in Northeast Syria, Turkey's position has also shifted away from removing Assad towards, I think the only thing they care about now is uh, combating the Kurds the same way that the US combated ISIS. And so the Syrian opposition basically since mid 2013 and 2014 has received aid from patrons that was conditional on fighting groups other than the regime. Um, and I think that's something that we talk a lot about in our paper, which is the dislocation or the, the disassociation between patrons and their goals versus clients and their goals. And I think since 2014 and the rise of ISIS and then subsequently the rise of the Kurds, um, the interest of foreign patrons has uh, exponentially diverged from that of the Syrian opposition to the point where I don't even think they have the same goals anymore. I think the Syrian opposition of course, they would like to overthrow Assad, but I don't think there's any patron that's serious about doing that. Um, and so, I, yeah, that's what I would say about that. One thing in the paper I want to ask you about before we turn to sort of concluding remarks um, is there's an interesting point in the paper that often when a um, foreign patron is looking into a conflict like Syria, there's an assumption they can get the most sort of influence or control over a situation with um, by sponsoring or supporting a faction or network that is not already um, dominant or powerful in the conflict. Um, one of the lessons I drew from your paper is that often choosing the more the sort of factions that may be able to negotiate or challenge the sponsor um, less can backfire if they're not sufficiently well capitalized in the conflict itself. Can you talk a bit about how that played out in the conflict and what lessons that has for understanding um, various international strategies of intervention? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's almost a counterintuitive finding, right? Because you expect that uh, groups that are less well capitalized will be easier to control by those who are uh, outside and try, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it's actually in some cases the opposite. And I think that's because you need to disaggregate the idea of proxy client relationships into two dimensions. One is interest. Do the interests of the of the client and the um, uh, and sort of the, the patron, do they overlap or do they diverge? And that's one dimension. The second dimension is how cohesive is the client? Um, so you can have with those two, you can have a possible four different combinations of those two, right? Um, but for example, if the interest of the patron and the client are the same or overlap, then it is uh, conducive to that relationship if the client is uh, more cohesive, right? Um, so if they have the overlapping interests like Qatar did with uh, elements of the, that emerge out of the brotherhood or with Ahar Sham, then the fact that Ahar Sham and the brotherhood were more cohesive and ha could exert more command and control actually benefit, you know, enabled or facilitated the, the uh, patron client relationship. Uh, and on the flip side of that, where with the US and Saudi, when they're backing tribal forces and liberal forces, even if the interests were to overlap, which I'm not even sure that was true, but even if they were to overlap, the fact is that the lack of cohesion and lack of command and control meant that, they were, that the, the clients are very hard to control. So uh, I think that is sort of an explanation for what would seem to be a, a counterintuitive uh, type of thing. I don't know, Jeremy or Elizabeth, if you had anything to add to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think with regards to I mean, the uh, Qatari uh, and provincial merchant network and their relationship, um, I mean, a lot of it is just simply, you know, trust built over time. Uh, that was a relationship that had been built over uh, 30 years in many instances. Um, th these were much more organic relationships. Um, and so the command and control structure, as Anand described, was much more seamless and cohesive. The, 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 the proxy or the, the client force itself was also cohesive. Um, and I think it's kind of just one thing leads to another. You know, the, the fact that the provincial merchant network was itself cohesive uh, facilitated uh, its uh, uh, swift accumulation of capital inside Syria, which facilitated um, its ability to cultivate ties abroad uh, to Qatar. And then if you just let that simmer for about 30 years, um, you know, the, the networks are going to be much stronger than if you do what United States did in many cases, which was just kind of just parachute in and meet a bunch of meet random people and um, attempt to direct them towards certain uh, goals. Um, and I mean, as Anand said, the, the forces that Saudi Arabia and the United States did support for reasons that we touched on in the paper themselves weren't really cohesive amongst themselves. And so if the United States would attempt to direct them towards a certain goal. I mean, you know, the Syrian opposition is notorious for the free oh, it looks like we may have lost with which it uh, unites and then, you know, this unites and then the commander feels that he can uh, do better. Uh, I believe my maybe my internet's cutting out. I'll let somebody else speak. Yeah? Well, we're coming to the end of the talk. So um, let me give you all an opportunity to make any sort of concluding remarks. And I'll also throw you a question to um, broaden out or end on, which is um, what is one network we didn't discuss or a change in a network that has occurred over the past 10 years of war or another dynamic in the conflict that you think will shape the next um, phase of the Syrian conflict that people should be paying attention to? So uh, maybe I'll go first. Um, so I think that um, a trend that is uh, very briefly, uh, I think like in one sentence mentioned in the report is uh, kind of the Proxianization of the of the Syrian opposition. Uh, we are essentially uh, now looking at an opposition. Um, you know the areas that are under its control. Uh, Northern Aleppo is 
basically controlled by factions that are straight up proxies of Turkey. They serve Turkish interests, not the interests of Syrians or the Syrian opposition. They have not fought against the Assad regime uh, since you know, 2015, before they were basically established and cohered into a force that Turkey is using. They went to fight in Libya and in, in Azerbaijan as, as straight up mercenaries to advance Turkish goals, fighting forces that have nothing to do with uh, the Syrian conflict. Um, and uh, also in, uh, in Idlib, what we're witnessing is uh, the area is under the dominance of Hayat Tahrir Sham, which is, uh, I would never call them a Turkish proxy. The relationship with, with Ankara is very complex, but um, it is a force that is increasingly um, adhering to uh, Turkish demands, essentially. And we saw it very clearly, for example, in the... Um, uh, now, uh, uh, you know, regular conducting of uh, patrols by uh, Russia uh, and, Tur and Turkey uh, in uh, southern Idlib, uh, those patrols along the Emperor Highway are protected by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, uh, despite uh, widespread public opposition to this. You know, Russia is responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of people living in Idlib. It is deeply unpopular to let these forces to come into this territory. Previously, uh, the leadership of HDS stated clearly that they will never accept the presence of any regime or Russian forces in Idlib, uh, and that if they want to be present in a certain territory, they need to take it militarily. And uh, now they're, um, you know, they're letting in uh, these forces. Uh, we are also seeing essentially, um, you know, uh, the, the of course, the Turkish proxies, but also HDS abiding essentially by ceasefires with the regime, uh, not conducting, uh, you know, cross line uh, operations, not launching any offensives, um, and also not carrying out attacks, uh, you know, deep in regime territory, even though they have the capacity to do so, particularly with the utter disintegration of the Syrian state and an incredible poverty, it is incredibly easy to recruit people now in regime areas to carry out attacks. There is widespread hatred towards the regime. Um, HDS still has supporters, uh, still has members in place who could carry out attacks and it chooses not to do so. Um, and this is out of commitment basically to the ceasefire to avoid provoking the regime. So. So therefore, uh, we're really kind of seeing a situation in which uh, Syrian actors are increasingly uh, marginalized and are basically used as, as tools by uh, outside forces. And this was really not the case, and I think the paper presents it really well, where yes, there were uh, joint interests and um, you know the support was significant. Without it, the uh, factions in Manbij and elsewhere would not have been able to operate and the civil war uh, would have ended in 2012 probably, um, but um, there was still a sense of independence, still Syrians were pursuing the goals that they set out for themselves, which is toppling the regime. Whereas now this is really uh, not a goal that any uh, opposition force is striving for, except really kind of uh, extremely tiny groups uh, like uh, Haras and like straight up jihadist groups that are being actively um, hunted down by HDS across Idlib. Just today, they carried out a major uh, arrest of a senior Haras al-Din leader. Um, so really we are, uh, we're seeing uh, kind of a very, very, uh, uh, a dynamic that really kind of uh, the Syrian opposition, the political and the armed, uh, uh, representation of it is increasingly uh, not uh, not a force that gets to make its own decisions. Jeremy, any concluding remarks? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll make this brief. I think one uh, interesting uh, development to follow in Syria and that is tied to more recent dynamics or network dynamics in the country can actually be found uh, in the place where the revolution began, which is in southern Syria, in uh, the province of Dera. Um, you know, there's been ever since you know, Dera was uh, retaken by regime forces in 2018, and ever since then, there has been uh, 
an underground insurgent movement against regime forces that has been sustained and at times quite violent and at times quite successful at temporarily even taking control of uh, entire towns or strings of towns in the area. Um, that itself is rooted in network dynamics. Um, you know, meant when the regime took over uh, the southern or southern Syria uh, in 2018, uh, they offered the opportunity for many uh, armed FSA factions to uh, avoid battle and switch sides and basically peacefully hand over control of their territory to the regime. And many factions uh, took them up on this offer and they frankly realized how outgunned they were and they didn't want to, uh, they, didn't, they didn't want to fight. Um, within that group of factions that uh, willingly switched sides and handed over territory to the regime, there have been some that have been privileged over others. Um, and the one, the most privileged uh, is uh, the Eighth Legion, which operates mostly around Busra Sham and Eastern Dara countryside, uh, which is who have been the recipients of major amounts of Russian patronage. About a month ago, or it may have been a little bit more, uh, there was a major armed uprising in one area in, in Western Dara, string of towns, um, that was that held out against regime against pro-regime forces for you know upwards of a week, maybe even more. Many people at the time were saying, oh, this is a reignition of the Syrian revolution in this area. You know, these are people who are finally uh, you know liberating territory from the regime the same way they did 10 years prior. However, upon further uh, you know when you look at it closely, what you find is that the people who rose up in this way took control of this these towns for a period of upwards of a week were simply the kind of losers or the have-nots within this larger group of people who voluntarily surrendered to the regime and for whatever reason didn't receive Russian patronage. Um, and so in a lot of ways, what these people were attempting to secure for themselves by rising up was much more narrow than what many even in Syrian media portrayed it as. You know, a lot of people in Syrian media said, oh, the revolution is starting again. Um, but really, um, these were people who, in Western Dara province, who were perhaps resentful of those in Eastern Dara province who were receiving Russian patronage and they were not. Um, and in Dara, it's also very tribal, and this can be um, looked at in terms of certain tribes getting benefits and other tribes or clans not. Um, and so that's a place where these dynamics are still at play, and I think it's very interesting to continue to see how they develop going forward. Thanks. Uh, I thought I would just very quickly try to answer one of the questions that wasn't answered in the Q&A, which was about water. Somebody asked about the issue of water versus bread. Uh, of course, water is very important. We just did a study in the city of Mimbesh and found that something like 39 or 40 percent of the city doesn't have access to regular drinking water because um, the water supply is intermittent. Um, so this is a, obviously a very important issue, but however, uh, it hasn't been until now uh, politicized in the same way the issue of bread has historically been politicized in Syria and in the Middle East uh, more broadly. Um, this is in part because the bread subsidy that the, the Syrian regime had in place was a very important way in which this, the uh, regime tried to uh, ensure its stability. And it tried to remove the bread sub subsidy in 2007, 2008, but wasn't really able to. Um, and this is not the case just in Syria and other countries. Egypt tried to remove it in 1977 and saw riots. And so they had to sort of retreat. Um, and the bread, you know, bread is not just a staple of the Syrian meal. It's kind of an indicator of um, the stability of, an, of a political order. And so we talk about a little bit in the paper how uh, the vicissitudes of bread prices um, was in some ways a proxy for uh, other issues of political stability inside the city of Membesh. And that's why we focus on bread more so than water. And the SDF does subsidize bread or uh, the, the ruling councils in SDF territory does subsidize bread now, uh, unlike the bread crisis that's ongoing, ongoing in the regime territories. Um, I, I was uh, really glad that Elizabeth mentioned uh, Derzur uh, because um, you know she's absolutely right that Derzur is a really important area to really understand. I think um, for the reasons that she mentioned, also because of the rise of ISIS, um, there's a few towns and areas in Derzur that were pretty instrumental in the early periods of ISIS in 2012, 2013. Um, fortunately, we have a number of studies 
that will be coming out kind of along the same veins. It looks at parts of Zero Zero. Jeremy is leading part of that. This is for the Zomia Center for the Study of Non-State Spaces, which is a organization that we have with a bunch of Syrian and Iraqi researchers that tries to do this sort of granular field work to try to, to understand what has happened and what may happen in the next few years. So definitely look out for that. Um, and then I'll just, I guess I'd wrap up by saying if there was one takeaway to impart upon you about the studies is on the question of fragmentation. Um, it was often discussed uh, in the media and elsewhere over the years in which the revolution was actually ongoing that this question of, of fragmentation was a strategic question. Like if the rebel factions had just gotten their act together and had decided to organize and unite, then things would be different. Um, but you know, what's interesting is uh, when I was on the ground in those years in 2012, 2014, every single person I met who was uh, of the armed opposition talked about the need to organize and to unite. And there was many efforts to try to do so. So there was certainly a will to try to have uh, unification of the rebel groups, but they weren't able to do it. And why was that? And I think one of the arguments we put forth in the paper is that um, it's not purely just a question of strategy. Strategies is a necessary but not sufficient condition for cohesion. And um, to understand what else is needed for cohesion, you have to look at the social structure of the society and the way in which the dictatorship of 40 years changed, transformed, and fragmented the social structure so that even if those people wanted to unify, the structural preconditions didn't exist to do so. And if there's anything else in this long paper that's a takeaway, I would, I would argue that's the most important takeaway. Thank you. Well, thank you all. There's, as Anand discussed, a lot more in the paper, which is available on New America's website. And there's a link in the chat if you can grab it before we end. Thank you to all of our speakers and who have shared a ton of the results of their own research um, with us and other products that are coming later. Have a good day.